Hey everyone, welcome back to Curbside Consults, one of the podcast series of the New England Journal of Medicine and AJM Group. I'm Clen, one of the senior editorial fellows. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Mary Korakowski, Emeritus Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. She's one of the authors on the Endocrine Society's new 2022 guidelines on the management of hyperglycemia in hospitalized adult patients in non-critical care settings. Dr. Korakowski, welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Dr. Korakowski, we like to give the listeners a glimpse into the guideline process. So can you just sort of walk us through the Endocrine Society and how they make recommendations and what sort of went into the development of this clinical practice guideline? Yes, there was a guideline for management of hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients with non-critical illness that was published in 2012. So the Endocrine Society felt that it was very important to update this guideline given the number of new articles and manuscripts that have been published and new evidence that has come to light. But they also revised the process for creating guidelines. In the past, guidelines were often created by a panel of people who were very involved in the processes involved in this particular aspect of clinical medicine. But this time, this was the beginning of a new process for the endocrine society using the GRADE process, which is a more rigorous process for developing and establishing recommendations. It is a process that has been endorsed and utilized by the Institute of Medicine and is used across the disciplines. So this was new to us. So we worked with people from McMaster's University and the Mayo Clinic with expertise in this method of developing guidelines and applied this to this clinical question. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's nice to see different societies coming together and agreeing on the methodology to do guidelines. So I think that's a huge step forward. Historically, the use of continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps in the inpatient setting has been sort of controversial in many hospitals, including ones where I've worked at. I remember a few cases where patients would come in and want to use their own devices, their own monitors or pumps, and the nurses would be uncomfortable with it, or I would get a notification from the charge nurse saying that I had to talk to the patient to not use it. What does the clinical practice guideline say about these devices now? Those are very important issues. So although they're related to each other, I'll just address them separately. The first is the use of insulin pumps in the hospital setting. So we had the same experience that you're describing of patients coming into the hospital using insulin pumps, but nurses were uncomfortable with this. And in many cases, these pumps were discontinued without appropriate institution of scheduled insulin therapy. So we looked at the literature and there was not a lot of randomized control trials. There was a lot of descriptive data about patients who were allowed to use or not allowed to use the pumps in the hospital. And the evidence suggests that it was very safe to allow patients to use these devices in the hospital, provided they had the mental and the physical capacity to do so. We also felt that it was very important to have access to people who were knowledgeable in insulin pump therapy to support patients who are using their pumps during the hospital setting and that this somehow be integrated as part of their day-to-day -day care. As far as continuous glucose monitors, I'm not sure that this is a controversial issue as much as it's an evolving issue. We know that a lot of our patients in the outpatient setting are using continuous glucose monitoring devices as part of their standard of care. And now we're seeing these patients come to the hospital with their own continuous glucose monitoring devices. What we addressed specifically in the guideline was introducing use of continuous glucose monitoring in patients who are not previously using these before hospital admission. And there is a growing level of evidence. There was actually a fair amount of evidence that we were able to use to evaluate in creating the guideline that showed that use of these devices it actually does reduce time spent in hypoglycemia, which is a rate limiting factor in glycemic management in the hospital setting, and improved mean glucose levels for patients in the hospital. Then to take this a step further, we know that patients are using these hybrid closed loop systems in the outpatient setting, where we did not do a systematic review for that specifically. We did extrapolate the use of pumps and continuous glucose monitoring, that patients be allowed to continue these devices according to hospital policy with oversight by personnel who are knowledgeable in the use of these devices in the hospital setting to support 
these patients in the hospital. That all makes sense. Dr. Korakowski, can you maybe give the listeners some caveats about the continuous glucose monitors and when they should not be used in which clinical settings and when should we confirm those values with point of care glucose testing? Yes, I can do that. The continuous glucose monitoring devices are not currently approved for use in the hospital. However, in April of 2020, when all our lives changed early in the pandemic, the FDA did provide allowance for these devices to be used in the hospital setting. And that really led to an explosion in their use in many hospital settings that did start using these. Part of the reasons for using these was that they did limit the number of visits a nurse had to make into a patient room in order to do a finger stick blood glucose because they could use almost like a telemetry type system where they had the readouts from the sensors outside a patient room. There is data showing that they can be used effectively in patients with non-critical illness. Their use in critically ill patients is an area of investigation because there's so much variability in the hemodynamics data status of critically ill patients. Outside critical care areas, though, patients who are on high doses of Tylenol, high doses of vitamin C, who are using hydroxyurea, which is used for a variety of instances, patients with severe skin lesions, patients with hemodynamic instability may not be optimal candidates for using this. As far as when to check a point of care glucose, the FDA recommends that these devices can be used to monitor therapy, but that a point of care blood glucose should be used to make any decisions regarding insulin dosing. That may change over time as more data comes out. There is published literature that has demonstrated that calibrations with patients' point of care glucose can be performed as little as twice a day with accuracy of results. There was a recent study that showed that these readings could be safely used for calculating insulin doses, but there is no approval for that yet. And so until there is more experience and more data demonstrating the efficacy, safety, and reliability of these readings, their use is considered experimental for the time being. Got it. So it sounds like to recap, we can use if the patients have the right mental capacity and the physical ability to use it, it's appropriate to use the continuous glucose monitors to get glucose readings, but if we were to try to adjust any of the insulin doses, the conservative approach would be to get a point of care glucose before doing that. Is that accurate? That is the current recommendation, which would basically mean going to point of care blood glucose monitoring about four times a day before meals and bedtime is the usual standard of care for people who are eating every four to six hours and people who are not eating. Great. Let's move on to a separate part of the guideline, and this topic is surgeries. And so what does the guideline say about patients undergoing elective surgeries and what their target hemoglobin A1C should be? Yes, we felt that this was an important question because many people on the writing panel worked in institutions where they saw that some surgeons paid no attention to what the glycemic control was prior to admission. And other surgeons who wanted very tight levels of glycemic control before they would operate on a patient. So we looked at the literature for this and came up with a question about whether or not it was important to have pre-specified glycemic measures before a patient underwent an elective surgical procedure. Emergency surgical procedures are something else. Those are people who have to have surgery at that time. But for elective surgical procedures, we found that the majority of data that's in the literature comes primarily from orthopedic and cardiac surgeries, but also from a variety of other surgeries. And the most data that is available relates to preoperative HbA1c levels. There's a variety of literature comparing A1c levels less than 6.5 to greater than 6.5, less than 7 to greater than 7, less than 8 to greater than 8, and even other specific measures. But the data really supports the need for glycemic control prior to surgery as a way of improving postoperative outcomes. And so the recommendation was to have HbA1c levels of less than 8% prior to surgery if that is feasible. 
We also acknowledge that it may not always be feasible for some people to get to an A1C level of less than eight prior to surgery, but that the surgery would be important for their future health care or ability to achieve these levels. So we also made the recommendation where it was not feasible to attain an HbA1c level of less than eight, that it would be important to have a preoperative blood glucose level of 100 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. This was meant to avoid needing to cancel surgical procedures, and it was also meant as a way of promoting postoperative outcomes. Now, the rationale for these recommendations was that patients who are under better glycemic control have a lower risk of postoperative complications, primarily infections, but also neurologic complications, respiratory complications, cardiac complications, and hospital length of stay, and even mortality. I think this is a new recommendation that I hadn't really seen in literature before. So I'm really excited to think about how we can improve the outcomes of our patients undergoing surgery. And I think this will be really relevant to a lot of hospitalists who have a lot of patients who are either post-op or awaiting operations and thinking more aggressively about their glucose management. What does the guideline mention about basal bolus insulin therapy versus correctional insulin? And what are some of the benefits and harms of each strategy? I'm really glad you asked that question because All members of the writing panel also struggled with this as well. You probably have seen the literature that said that sliding scale insulin should never be used. There's even been articles that have been titled death to sliding scale insulin. But then we found that many of us felt that there were times where this was appropriate to use while also acknowledging that there was times where sliding scale insulin was being overused inappropriately used is the approach for glycemic management. So with this topic, we made three different recommendations and we looked at three different populations. One population would be patients who have no prior history of diabetes, but who are admitted to the hospital and have elevated blood glucose levels, which we defined as blood glucose levels greater than 140. There's another population of patients who have known diabetes, usually type 2 diabetes, that's under good control and are receiving non-insulin therapies before they come into the hospital. And the third group of patients would be patients who are treated with scheduled insulin therapy, which is defined as basal insulin alone or in combination with uh, prandial insulin before meals, who represent a group for whom sliding scale insulin should never be used as the only form of therapy at time of hospitalization. So the recommendations were for the people with newly recognized hyperglycemia, but no evidence of uh, no prior history of diabetes, that sliding scale insulin, which can also be defined as correctional insulin, meaning you're correcting elevated blood glucose levels, can be used as initial therapy unless they declare that they are a candidate for scheduled insulin therapy, which we defined as two or more blood glucoses above 180 in a 24-hour period. The same would go for patients who are admitted to the hospital who were on non-insulin therapies prior to admission, for whom sliding scale or correctional insulin may be appropriate as long as their blood glucoses stay within the recommended range of 100 to 180. But any patient who was on scheduled insulin therapy prior to admission, that the scheduled insulin therapy in the form of basal insulin plus correction or basal bolus insulin be continued in the hospital. Yeah, I think that this sort of complex algorithm makes sense because, at least in my experience, the patients who require insulin previously are very unlikely to be controlled with sliding scale alone. And On the other hand, as you mentioned, there are patients who just have a touch of hyperglycemia where a sliding scale probably is a bit safer, in my opinion, than standing insulin doses where there's a risk of hypoglycemia. And they may declare themselves as needing scheduled insulin once they have documented blood sugars above a higher range, then you know you need to go to scheduled insulin, but possibly not for some patients. Making a transition to the non-insulin therapies, what does the guideline suggest about these in the inpatient setting? So that's also a very important issue and a question for everyone. One thing we were able to find is that there is very little data available regarding non-insulin therapies in the hospitals. There's lots of opinion. The two 
types of therapy where there is a fair amount of information is the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors and the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. So certainly we know that the GLP-1 receptor agonists, glucagon-like receptor agonists, that there are some agents that are administered once a week. So some patients may come in with those on board. But in terms of initiating these for glycemic management in the hospital, we recommended against that, given the fact that from the two studies that existed, there was a fair amount of nausea and vomiting in both studies require that patients receive additional insulin. With the DPP-4 inhibitors, we did make a recommendation that there were selected patients who could either continue or be started on these in the hospital setting. And this included patients with HbA1c levels less than 7.5% at time of hospitalization who had all their blood glucoses less than 180 And these obviously would be patients with type 2 diabetes, as this would not be appropriate for people with type 1 diabetes. This would also not be appropriate for anyone with a history of pancreatic disorders or pancreatitis, for whom these agents would be contraindicated, or anyone with severe hyperglycemia. I also want to make the point here, the other class of medications that gets a lot of questions is this new class, relatively new class of the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors or the SGLT2 inhibitors, which have really been shown to reduce progression of renal disorders as well as reduce risk for heart failure. There is a lot of data regarding the inpatient use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure, but they have really not been studied for glycemic management. So we felt we were unable to make any recommendation about using these for glycemic management in the hospital setting, particularly given concerns about euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis and risk for urinary tract and genital infections. We were also surprised that there really is no data for us to look at for inpatient use of metformin or sulfonylureas. And I think the guideline helps open the door for the fact that we need to investigate the safety and efficacy of these medications in the hospital. So final ureas, there is the concern that they could increase the risk for prolonged hypoglycemia. Metformin, the question remains open about the safety of using this in the hospital. I'm glad you brought up those other classes of medication that we get a lot of questions about. I think metformin is one particular one that there still remains a lot of controversy over whether or not to continue it in the inpatient setting. And I've also seen a lot of varying practices with SGLT2 inhibitors. So I'm glad that you're raising awareness that the literature does not give us the evidence to use them or to not use them in the inpatient setting. And we really need more studies that are rigorous to address these questions. The guideline also mentions diabetes self-management education and support as an important part of diabetes care. So I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on these and talk about the importance of teaching about diabetes care to our patients? Yes, well, this really sort of addresses a really important point because it is recommended that all patients with diabetes receive self-management education. And this has usually been relegated to the outpatient arena. But there is a shortage of diabetes nurse educators and many patients just because of scheduling difficulties or accessibility to diabetes education do not receive any form of diabetes self-management education in terms of what lifestyle measures to use to help control their blood sugars, appropriate use of medications, what a low blood sugar is, what a high blood sugar is. And we know that patients who are not under good glycemic control have a higher risk for being hospitalized in the first place. So it was the thought of many of the members of the writing panel that hospitalization provides the opportunity to provide education to patients. And so we actually looked at the literature that examined this question and found that providing some form of education about self-management in the hospital setting not only resulted in better levels of glycemic control at three and six months following hospital discharge, but also reduce the risk for 
hospital readmission at three and six months following discharge. So it's a very cost-effective strategy to reduce the need for hospitalization in patients. Many hospitals have a high percentage of their inpatient population who have diabetes. Some places it's as high as 25 to 30 percent. So it may not be feasible to provide this for all patients, but providing education to patients who are newly diagnosed, who have recurrent admissions for hyperglycemia or severe hyperglycemia, such as diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar hyperglycemia, or recurrent severe hypoglycemia, these would be candidates for education as a way of improving their long-term outcomes. This is best done by someone who has expertise and knowledge in diabetes care and management, such as a diabetes care and education specialist. Someone who is certified would be optimal. Someone who is working toward the certification would also be optimal. And these people could provide education to staff nurses who could then convey this to patients. So it's not reliant on one person to do all of this. I just want to stress the importance of diabetes education to our patients. And I know sometimes there are different institutions I've worked in. There has been a bottleneck of educators who are available to do this education. And at times I really wish that I had been trained in it or have sort of the savviness to be able to teach my patients (laughs) how to prevent readmissions. But I think this is an area where we could all improve. And certainly there are people who are listening who want to help with these processes and increase the workforce for diabetes care. I totally approve of that and support them. Dr. Korakowski, is there anything else you would like to highlight from the guidelines that we have not covered yet? The areas that I was thinking about uh, to highlight are issues that can provoke hyperglycemia that needs to be addressed in the hospital setting. Probably one of the most common areas that can be associated with inpatient hyperglycemia and fairly severe levels of hyperglycemia with blood sugars greater than two and 300 is the use of glucocorticoids. Many people who come into the hospital require high dose glucocorticoids for a variety of reasons and a variety of conditions. And we know that about 50% of people with no prior history of diabetes will develop hyperglycemia following high doses of glucocorticoids, and up to 80% of people with known diabetes will have an exacerbation of hyperglycemia. We actually looked at different approaches for managing hyperglycemia in patients receiving glucocorticoids in the hospital. In the literature, there are a variety of strategies, and we were not able to identify that one strategy was necessarily better than another. For example, increasing doses of current insulin may have the same efficacy as adding a dose of NPH insulin to counteract hyperglycemia mediated by prednisolone or prednisone, but that attention, that by paying attention, monitoring more frequently and responding to elevations in blood glucoses in these patients actually can favorably affect outcomes and help avoid adverse consequences of hyperglycemia. Enteral nutrition is another area where patients without a prior history of diabetes can actually develop hyperglycemia. It doesn't happen with the same frequency that it does with glucocorticoids, but these would be important areas to be aware of. Thank you for reminding us of these populations and I know in medical school and in residency, I was taught that these patients should be on NPH, but it sounds like you've opened up the doors or this guideline has opened up the doors for people to consider various types of insulin therapy or hyperglycemia in these patients and not necessarily only use NPH. I personally use NPH. I like that approach, but we couldn't say that that approach was better than others. Perfect. Yeah. And we like to say on the show when things are evidence-based versus just sort of based on our, our expert opinion or anecdotal. And so I also personally use NPH, but it's good to know where the evidence stands on things. So I think that wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Merrick Korakowski for joining us today to discuss the latest Endocrine Society guidelines on the management of hyperglycemia in the hospitalist adult patient in the non-critical care setting. We are always looking for ways to improve our podcast and educational material. So if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave a review on iTunes or email us at resident360 at nejm.org. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston-Perry, 
Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomas's, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM education editor, Dr. Opie Hamnick. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of NEJM Group.